Anna. And I'm Joel. Welcome, Welcome to, to Creekside Online. Online. It's December and Christmas is right around the corner. So let us tell you some exciting things that we have going on here at Creekside this Christmas season. Make sure to join us in person Sunday, December 19th as our choir and orchestra will be leading a special Christmas celebration service at 9 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. in the auditorium. We want to let you know that there will be no venue service and our kids programming will be nursery through kindergarten only that morning. But this is a great service for all the generations, so join us as a family for our Christmas celebration service. Christmas Eve, we have two services for you to choose from, 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. Our 5 p.m. Christmas Eve service will have a special element just for kids. Peter Newman will be leading contemporary Christmas songs and Pastor Scott will be bringing us a special Christmas message. And then at 11 p.m., you can bring in Christmas morning and join us for our Christmas candlelight service. Pastor Scott will be speaking at this service as well and there'll be a classical Christmas worship set. We'd also like to tell you about something exciting happening next Sunday, December 12th. Two years ago in December, we sponsored hundreds of kids and raised money to build three churches in the country of Ecuador. Next week, we're gonna share an update of what's happening in Ecuador and give you an opportunity to sponsor a child in Ecuador in case you didn't get a chance to two years ago. If this is your first time joining us online, we'd love to call and say hello. Text the word GUEST to 888-111 and someone will contact you. Or if you need prayer, you can text the words NEED PRAYER to 888-111 and someone will reach out and pray with you. We are so thankful for your generous giving. And because of your generosity, we have been able to bless those in need this December with what you've given to Creekside. If you'd like to give to Creekside, you can text the word GIVE to the number here on the screen. Let's worship together.
is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace Welcome to Creekside Christian Church. I'm Pastor Scott Hansen, and for the last few weeks, Creekside has been on a journey to find Christmas in the Old Testament, to unpack clues that God has given us in the distant past, which clearly add mosaic pieces to the Messiah mystery. And the image that is surfacing is already fascinating and beautiful, but it is not yet complete. Like a half-finished mosaic, really. When Jesus raised from the dead, nobody expected it because nobody had figured out the Messiah mystery. So he appeared to his fearful and confused disciples and he, he clearly had, they had clearly not put the mosaic together. So he began the process of explaining how the pieces of this spectacular Messiah mosaic come together. We read about that in Luke chapter 24 when Jesus, the raised to Jesus, right? He says, to all of his disciples when he appears to them, everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now I want you to look carefully at this verse because it's really the table of contents for this Messiah Mystery Christmas series. 
We're looking for clues, prophecies, symbols, types, allegories, promises, shadows, pointing forward to the Christmas story in the Law of Moses, which is Genesis through Deuteronomy, in the Psalms, which is really Job through Song of Solomon, but predominantly the Book of Psalms, and the Prophets, which would be Jewish history books with an emphasis on the prophets Isaiah through Malachi. Now, we spent the last couple of weeks in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, which is part of the Law of Moses. And here are some of the Messiah, the Messiah mosaic pieces that we've already found concerning the Christmas Messiah. I'm going to list them real quickly here. Uh, but this is what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, that this Messiah would be the source of light for the eye and the soul. Divinity and humanity combined together offer us immortality. He'd be the seed of the woman. He would set us free from Satan's grip and the powers of hell. He'd be our appropriate clothing, protection from coming wrath. He would come from the family tree of Abraham, offer universal blessing to all nations. He'd be the Lion of Judah and the King of all kings. And he would offer us delivery through suffering, his self-offering sacrifice would be what we need, and it would be a substitution in his death. Now, next week, we're going to look for the Christmas Messiah in the Psalms. And the following week, we're going to search for him in the prophets. But today, we need to look for Jesus the Messiah in the remaining books of the Law of Moses. That's Exodus through Deuteronomy. Now, I have a little bit of a confession to make. Because this, when I went through this study, it kind of drove me crazy because there's so much to cover. It was like I was in a gold mine and there were gold veins everywhere running in every direction. But the people outside the mine were telling me to hurry up and just grab whatever I could and come out. It feels a little bit like I've been given a million dollars, but I only have a couple of minutes to spend the money. Now, there are so many clues, prophecies, types and shadows in these four books. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that I'm only going to kind of glance off those last three books, and we're going to spend the majority of our time in the book of Exodus. And in fact, one of the mosaic pieces of the Messiah mystery in the book of Exodus, which is the Passover lamb, it is so great that it's a perfect setup for, for coming to the Lord's table and receiving communion. So we plan to do that toward the end of this message. Now, if you are here present on campus, hopefully you've been handed a little communion serving a plastic cup like this. If not, if you're at home, we encourage you to stop this video now and uh, go secure some bread and grape juice or red wine. But listen, I just can't help myself. I have to show you, before we go to Exodus, I have to show you at least a few rapid fire Messiah sightings in the books of Leviticus. Numbers and Deuteronomy before we circle back to the book of Exodus. So let's start with Leviticus. Okay, now listen, most people would never think to look for Jesus sightings or the Messiah in the book of Exodus, but I assure you that he is there. Okay, and he's there in the sacrifices which are fulfilled perfectly in the Christ. I wish we could spend a lot more time on this particular passage, but I'm just going to kind of give you general outline details of how Jesus fulfills the Levitical sacrifices in the first seven chapters of this book. And let me just kind of briefly run them, run them by you, okay? First of all, uh, as people approached God, they were to offer a burnt offering, which was, which was symbolically pointing forward to the full surrender of Jesus Christ and his life to do the perfect will of the Father, the sin offering where Jesus Christ would offer his perfect divine blood as the atoning price to buy us back, to make us one with the Father. He would offer the guilt offering, which would not only cleanse us of sin, but it would also cleanse our consciences of that guilt that we carry. The grain offering, which represents the perfect sinless life work of Christ offered to the Father in our place. And then lastly, the peace offering, where by his broken body, by his blood shed, he would offer us reconciliation with the Father. We sing about this at Christmas time. You may not have noticed that, but hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinner reconciled. So Jesus and Christmas are in Leviticus. What about Numbers? Well, there's one really clear reference in the book of Numbers in chapter 21, the bronze serpent, which is a type of Christ's healing. The bronze serpent, a type of Christ's healing. Now, we, 
We spent a lot of time in this story when we did the Land Between series some time back. So I'm not going to go back over all those details. Let me just summarize this, okay? In Numbers chapter 21, verses 9, 4 through 9, we find the Israelites complaining in the desert again and again and again against God, against his appointed leader Moses, and God had had enough. So the Lord sent venomous vipers who were biting the people, and they were dropping like flies from the poison that was disseminating in their bodies. And Moses begged God for help. He prayed for the people. And the Lord told him about an unusual solution. The Lord told him since they were being bitten by snakes, he was to make a bronze serpent or snake. And bronze, by the way, is the symbol of judgment. And once he had created the mold and, and, and they had crafted this bronze serpent, he was to lift it on a very, very high pole so that everyone of Israel could see. And if anyone who looked to the serpent in faith, God said they would be healed from the killing poison that was taking its toll in their bodies. In Numbers chapter 21 at verse 8, we read, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. It would have to be very high. Two and a half million people had to see it. And anyone who was bitten can look at it and live. Look and live. Looking to the bronze serpent in faith brought about temporary miraculous healing from poison. But looking to Jesus Christ in faith brings eternal spiritual healing. Jesus refers to the story and says that snake was a type of what he was about to do on the cross. In John chapter 3 at verse 14, Jesus says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So the bronze serpent of Numbers 21 was a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus was the fulfillment. Snake was the shadow. Jesus was the substance, and Jesus is the one that would actually bring us eternal spiritual healing. The next clue we'll jump to the book of Deuteronomy is actually a prophecy, and it speaks of Jesus being the greatest of all prophets. Jesus, the greatest of all prophets. Moses was viewed by the Israelites as the most amazing prophet and leader of all time. I mean, it was like the final word. Uh, little Jewish boys would have Moses bed sheets on their bed and play with little action figures, right? Batteries not included. I'm joking. But the Bible tells us Moses actually spoke face to face with God. Does it get any better? I mean, he told Moses things like a friend. But Moses himself predicted that an even greater prophet one day the prophet of all prophets was still to come. And in fact, in John chapter 5, 46, Jesus himself says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. And indeed, Moses did. Here's the prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, 15. Moses says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. Look at this. You must listen to him. And then three verses later, he circles back and says it again. Moses says, I will raise up for them, speaking for God, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. That's more than what Moses did. Word for word, speaking for God. Now, I want you to note that God the Father will raise this great prophet up. He will be a fellow Jew, and he will be even greater than Moses or any other Old Testament prophet. So we must therefore listen to him. Now, last week we saw from Genesis 49.10 that the Christmas Messiah would be the Lion of Judah. He would be the King of all kings. And now we see that the Christmas Messiah will also be the prophet of all prophets. And oh, how I wish I could, I could show you other Messianic clues from Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but no time, no time. The book of Exodus is calling us. It's so full that we just have to turn our attention to the book of Exodus now. And we do so by looking at the very person of Moses himself, because Moses, the liberator, was a type of Christ, a type of the Messiah. 
In the first 12 chapters of Exodus, we see this. Since we're just talking about Moses, let's consider what God called him to do and how it points forward or overlays on the story of the Messiah. Now, in broad stroke details, God sees a people suffering under bondage and oppression. He then allows a special child to be born from among the Jews who was miraculously protected from the wrath of the king. Think Herod the Great, the slaughter of the babies of Bethlehem. Now this special child would grow up and he would be called to set his people free. Miraculous signs would accompany his ministry. He has a, a showdown with the powers of hell and he prevails. He promises deliverance for all who believe, but also warns of judgment and death for all who do not believe. He shows people how to escape slavery and death by leading them to freedom. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we just found a whole bunch of mosaic pieces to be placed in the, the Messiah mosaic. Moses, the liberator, a type of Christ. Here's another one early on in the book of Exodus. It has to do with the Exodus itself, which is a type of salvation in Christ. The Exodus is a type of salvation in Jesus Christ. What about this exodus from Egypt? It's, it's just full of clues pointing forward to the salvation story in Christmas, right? Now, I need to give you a little bit of a clue. We need to remember that one of the dominant symbols of the Pharaoh of Egypt in ancient times was actually a snake. I want you to look at this. When they, when they dug up the tombs of these pharaohs, it was very, very common to find this snake coming right off the headdress of Pharaoh. And in fact, if you've ever watched the Ten Commandments at Easter time, you'll remember that Yul Brenner as the pharaoh would have that snake coming off his headdress as well. And I don't know why, but some people think I look like this guy, tall, dark, and handsome. I don't see the similarity. But back to the story. You've got a pharaoh that's representing a snake, and a snake in this case is Genesis 3 snake. It's not good. Now, I want, to, I want to read to you a part of this Exodus story because it underlines what's going on here concerning salvation. In Exodus chapter 9, at verse 13 and following, we read this. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh, and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. That's God's goal for you and me, that we be set free, that we may worship and serve God. The text goes on to say, or this time he's threatening Pharaoh, or this time I will send the full force of my plagues against you and against your officials and your people, so you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. This would be the 10th plague. For by now, God says to Pharaoh, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Wow. Listen, you and I, we're under the bondage of sin and death. And we can't do anything to save ourselves. We're oppressed by the power of the serpent, the snake, the devil. Our situation is absolutely hopeless. God sees the misery of our condition and he raises up a savior. And the savior faces our oppressor and won't take no for an answer. Let my people go that they may worship me, serve me. The oppressor turns up the heat and struggles to hold his victims, but then God performs miracles that unmask all the false gods and all the lies of the devil. God makes a provision of salvation for those who come under the blood sacrifice of the innocent lamb, and then they partake or commune of this lamb eating its roasted meat. God makes a way of salvation against impossible odds through two walls of water. As the Egyptian enemy is pursuing them, God closes those walls of water and the people of God are symbolically baptized in and through the waters of the Red Sea as they head for testing in the desert, followed by victorious living in the promised land. Oh, people, it is hard for me to imagine God giving us a clearer picture in typological symbolic form regarding the story of salvation in Jesus Christ. The Messiah mystery is whispering. No, no, no. It's screaming at us to find the Christmas Messiah in, in, these, in this type that we have before us. Now, our next clue as we move through this Messiah mystery has to do with the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, which offers guidance and protection 
guidance and protection. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 says this. It says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Now, number one, you wouldn't mess with the people like this if they're being guided so graphically by God. But number two, God even made provision for them to travel by night because it's hot in the desert. Now, there are multiple references in the books of Exodus and Numbers to this cloud protecting, covering, and guiding the Hebrews through the desert by day and the pillar of fire doing the same by night. For example, Exodus chapter 30 at verse 36, we read, In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So God basically showed them when to go, when to stop, and where to go. Then we see in the next verse, So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. You talk about guidance and protection. Now, I would like to suggest to you that the cloud and the pillar, they're actually symbols and types pointing forward to the Christ of Christmas, Christ who is our ultimate guidance and protection. So again, we have a couple of additional mosaic pieces for those of you that are paying attention and carefully looking. Here's our next clue. Bread from the sky and water from the rock, sustaining provision. Bread from the sky, water from the rock, sustaining provision. Once the people of Israel made it safely out of Egypt into the Sinai Peninsula, it didn't take long before they ran out of bread to eat and water to drink. And somehow God's people, about two and a half million of them, needed to be sustained for 40 years of desert wandering. So we read in Exodus chapter 16 at verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down, because they asked for bread, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. Exodus chapter 16, verse 13 says that in the morning there was this layer of dew around the camp. And when the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. And when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? They said, manna, manna, right? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Exodus 16, 31 says, The people of Israel called the bread manna. Now think about this and what Jesus said centuries later, almost 1,500 years later. Jesus says in John 6, at verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Three verses later, he said it just super clearly. I am the bread of life. And then Jesus went on to explain that the manna in the desert was given to sustain life day by day, temporarily. It was a type or symbol that pointed forward to the provision of the Son of God's death and resurrected life, which would sustain people who believe forever. And what about the water? They needed water as well. In, in Exodus chapter 17, at verse 1, we read, there was no water for the people to drink. You're going to die in the desert without water. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink, as if Moses could do that. In Exodus chapter 17, God told Moses actually to march up to this huge rock and with his staff in front of all the people. He was to strike that rock and water would gush out of that rock. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, this is how God provided sustaining water for about three, about two and a half million Hebrews in the desert for 40 years. There's no water out in that desert, folks. This is amazing. Everywhere they traveled, by the way, they had daily bread, give us today our daily bread, from the sky and a strange rock everywhere they went that gushed forth water. Now, in case you think I'm stretching this as a type of Christ, Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, using this as a symbol, it says, 
For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers all ate the same spiritual food, manna, and drank the same spiritual drink, water from the rock. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Jesus provided them drink. Jesus provided them food. He was their drink and their food in the desert. That's the Christmas Messiah, centuries before he came as a baby. Here's another clue. It has to do with the tabernacle. And I got to move fast on this one. I don't want to, but I need to. Tabernacle, where we meet with God. Everything about the tabernacle speaks of Jesus Christ. I wish I had more time to walk through these details, but stated succinctly, all the details of the tabernacle point to the work of the Christmas Messiah. This was the holiest place on earth. They called it the house of God. They also called it the tent of meeting. It was a provided place where sinful, fallen human beings could connect with their holy God without dying. Now, as we quickly go over some of the details of this tabernacle, you need to keep in mind the words of Jesus Christ from John chapter 14, okay? Because Jesus speaks in tabernacle language in John 14 when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. I'm your passageway. And no one comes to the Father. No one goes into the Holy of Holies except through me. Now, the entrance of this tabernacle, and we'll kind of move through this. The entrance of this tabernacle is where people would bring their sacrifice, lay their hands on it, confess their sins, there'd be transference, and they would consign their sacrifice to the priest. And the priest would move forward with that sacrifice and take it to the bronze altar of judgment. What we have here is Christ, our high priest, and our offering. And that sacrifice, which in our case is Christ himself, would be completely consumed on the bronze altar of judgment. And then the priest would move forward doing work for us as a mediator to the laver of water made of bronze as well, where he would wash his hands and be clean, cleansed after the sacrifice. Again, Christ our cleansing. Then the priest would move in through this outer curtain into the holy place. And in the holy place to his right, he would see the table of showbread, 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel and how God made provision and sustained them with bread in the desert. When he looked to his left, he would see the candelabra, the seven branched candelabra constantly lit and offered light, reminding us that Jesus is our sustenance and our light. Then the priest would move forward right before this curtain in the inner place, before the Holy of Holies, and find the, uh, this would be the incense table made of pure gold. And what was going on here is they would constantly light this beautiful smelling incense, which represented the prayers that would rise before God, reminding us that Christ is our intercession. Now you have this curtain at this point and it's a hand breadth thick and that curtain had to be passed through but only once a year by the high priest and what's fascinating is is that the new testament tells us that curtain represents the torn body of jesus christ the moment that jesus christ died on the cross we read at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom now in hebrews chapter 10 20 we're told that the ripping of the curtain of the separation between us and the immediate presence of God, it was a type of Christ's body torn apart on the cross for us. And the type is incredible because here, what Jesus does on the cross grants true believers 24-7 access to the throne of God. In Hebrews chapter 10, we read this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. In other words, come, worship, proceed forward, be be silent, come in and pray. 24-7 access to the Father has been com accomplished through Christ for you and for me. 
And then once we enter into the Holy of Holies, which would be that, by the way, Jesus at this point becomes our barrier destroyer, praise the Lord. But when we actually enter into that final third of this, of this tent, it was called the Holy of Holies. The actual tent would have been covered. We've opened it so you can kind of see the details here, okay? The Holy of Holies. The first impression would be there is no candles and yet it is completely illuminated by the Shekinah glory of God and the Shekinah glory of God would reveal it. They would turn the, the priest, the high priest, only once a year on the Day of Atonement would see the Ark of the Covenant completely covered inside and out with gold. On the top of the Ark would be the lid or the mercy seat with the two angels that are hovering over that and inside this Ark it contained the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments represented the laws that every human being has broken. And the cover of this lid or this box was called the mercy seat, and that's where the high priest presented the blood of a sacrifice once a year to cover over sin, his sin and the people's sin, temporarily. It would come between the broken laws of God and God's holiness so that people could be temporarily forgiven. And it had to happen year after year after year. What's the point? Only in Christ do you and I have mediated forgiveness with the Father. That's what we find here, mediated forgiveness with the Father. Without forgiveness, there can be no reconciliation or salvation with God. Do you see now why no one can truly access our holy God except through Jesus Christ? No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. The Christmas Messiah is our high priest, our offering, our cleansing, our provision, our light, our intercession, our torn sacrifice, our barrier-destroying, access-granting, only way into the 24-7 presence of a Father. Wow! Ah. Next clue! The Ten Commandments, since we're on a roll and we just went in there and we saw where the Ten Commandments are kept, let's talk about them for a second. The Ten Commandments, they, re they represent Jesus accomplishing perfection for us. Jesus is perfection for us. Think about this for just a second. The only way that you and I could ever attempt to save ourselves is to perfectly obey every single law of God. Good luck on that. With the Ten Commandments, they're the foundation of that law. And without ever sinning, even once, that's how you self-qualify. So I, I would encourage you to find another route. No one could ever reach that lofty standard. We're told in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, the obvious, that all have sinned, all human beings, and fall short of the glory of God, of these standards. What's fascinating is in Jesus' perfect life on earth, he asked his, his enemies one time in John 8, 46, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? And even though they hated Jesus, they couldn't name one because Jesus lived a sinless life. He kept the law of God and the Ten Commandments perfectly, and then he transferred that perfection into the bank account of believers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, at verse 21, we read that God made him Christ who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in Him, Christ, we might become the righteousness or perfection of God. Hallelujah. There is one who lived his life perfectly before the laws of God, for you and for me, one who perfectly obeyed and fulfilled the righteous requirements of God. And then He became our substitute sacrifice. Jesus stepped into the gap and became sin for us. And in exchange, He also transferred His perfection or righteousness into the bank account, the spiritual bank account of whoever asks in faith. Now I need to ask you, can you think of a more appropriate introduction of communion with our God? Next clue as we enter into a time of communion. It's the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb. We find this in Exodus chapter 12. You see, upon entering today, if you're here on campus, you should have received a small little plastic cup right here that contains a wafer on the top as well as grape juice below. If you don't have those, we'd encourage you to pause this and go and try to find uh, some 
bread or uh, wine or grape juice, or if you're here on campus, just raise your hand and someone will help you. Someone will get you those symbols, okay? We not only find, we not only want to find today the Christmas Messiah among the continuous clues of the Old Testament, what we really want to do is commune with him this morning. So as we backtrack in Exodus just a bit, in Exodus chapter 12, when God was about to bring the people of Israel out of 400 years of backbreaking, brick-making slavery, the land as they came out of the land of Israel and Israel or out of the land of Egypt, and Egypt was experiencing the tenth and final plague, an awful plague. It was the plague of the death angel coming over and striking dead the firstborn of every family. Every firstborn child or animal in the entire land of Egypt was going to die that night. So God told the Jewish people that they were. Uh, that there was only one remedy, only one escape that would protect them from the death angel, angel who was about to come through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn child. And that one escape route was to pick an innocent male lamb without defect or blemish. Bring that lamb into your home for four days to inspect it, to make sure it's perfect. Grow attached to that lamb. Your children would probably play with it, maybe even give it a name. But after four days, they were to slaughter the lamb and collect its blood for a very distinct purpose. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 7, the Israelites were told to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses. Strange thing to do. Then all the Jewish people, by faith, were to take every member of their family and enter into their homes and go through the blood door, under the blood door, hide themselves inside the blood, if you will, and together they were actually supposed to then eat the meat of the roasted sacrificial lamb. Hiding under the blood of the lamb, they were also to commune and become one with the lamb by eating the roasted meat of the lamb. And then when the death angel saw the blood covering, the death angel literally passed over those homes, and the people of faith in the blood of the lamb were safe. They were saved. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says this, It says that Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. I want you to open up uh, this this cup, the top part of it, and I want you to take some bread. I'm going to use a little bigger symbol so we realize what's going on. What we're going to do is we're going to partake of these symbols. But as you do, I want you to think in terms of being one of those Jewish people back in Egypt. You're inside your home, there's blood on your door, you're eating the lamb, and you hear screams outside. You hear people grieving outside because they didn't do that and they're losing their firstborn children. Perhaps your small child is saying, Mom, Dad, I need to go to the bathroom, can I go outside? And you're saying, absolutely not. If you need to go, just go in your tunic. You are not going outside, there is death outside. By partaking of these symbols, of the broken body and shed blood of our Lord, we are actually entering into a profound ancient Christmas Messiah story and mystery. By faith, we celebrate with trembling like those Jewish people about to leave Egypt, trembling as we find ourselves by faith in Christ, because it is only in Christ, our only escape, that we are loved by God, forgiven by God, reconciled to God, adopted by God, protected by God, and safe, spiritually safe, saved forever. So take this symbol, isn't it interesting, another symbol or type, and we encourage you to think of this as you are feeding on the Lamb and taking the very life of Christ as a symbol into your being so you become one with Christ as we celebrate this element and approach the Lord's table. Let's partake together. Jesus drawing our attention back 
to what happened that first Passover. He also reminds them of the blood that was shed and painted over the doorposts. And he actually says in the New Testament, this blood is, is sealing a pact in the new covenant, a pact that is sealed by blood and death. And so I want you to also partake of this element in memory of me. So open up that little container and let's partake of this, this symbol, this beautiful, beautiful type pointing to the reality of the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross for us the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Let's partake together. Father, we want to thank you for inviting us to the table of your Son and for giving us one and only escape from the coming judgment by faith in your Son, Jesus, who is the perfect Lamb. Now, friends, one last clue before we call it a day. This last clue, I'm just going to call it I am, where Jesus the Messiah is clearly demonstrated to be God in the flesh. Out in the desert, when Moses saw a burning bush, he'd been there for 40 years, and that bush was strangely not consumed. So out of curiosity, Moses just drew near to that bush. And as he did, God spoke to him from this strange burning bush. And he told him to remove his sandals because the, he was standing on holy ground. Moses did so. And then God called Moses to go back to Egypt and to set his people free. In Exodus chapter 3 at verse 13, we read that Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And the next verse in the Bible, it contains the highest, the holiest, and the most glorious name of God. It is so holy that even today, Jewish people never speak this name out loud. In, in Exodus chapter 13, at verse 14, God said to Moses, I am. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you or sent me to you. That's his high and holy name. And almost 1,500 years later, the Jewish leaders were trying to trap Jesus as well as figure out who he really was. And during a very intense interrogation, our Lord Jesus, he revealed his true identity to them and to us today for all time. You see, this is, this is the, the highest, most glorious piece to the, the Messiah mystery mosaic. Jesus says this, he says, your, your fa John chapter 8, verse 56, Jesus says, your father Abraham, he rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. And they're going, what? Moses, Abraham lived 2,100 years ago. So they say in verse 57 of John 8, he says, they say, you are not yet 50 years old. Speaking of Jesus, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham. At that point, Jesus says this in verse 58. He says, very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. That's the Greek version of the Hebrew. He said, ego me. He said, I am. In case you missed it, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is claiming to be God Almighty. Now, in case you didn't catch the meaning of these words, the Jewish leaders fully understood what Jesus was saying, and they were outraged because he claimed to be God in the flesh. So the next verse in this chapter said that the Jewish leaders picked up stones to, to stone him to death because they said he was blaspheming because he claimed to be God. We've covered a lot of ground today, haven't we? Though you may feel a little bit as though you've been drinking from a fire hose, I sort of apologize, but want to remind you I had a million dollars and only a couple of minutes to spend it. What I want to assure you is that we actually skipped a number of other clues, types, and prophecies and shadows in the law pointing forward to the Christmas Messiah. He's everywhere. But we've done enough for today. So as you head to your cars and your homes after this service, I hope you do so with a much clearer idea of how great the Lord Jesus Christ really is, heaven's Christmas Messiah, and how much your God loves you. 
I hope you're starting to accurately put together this Messiah mosaic in such a way that the grand design is beginning to emerge in beautiful detail and color. We do have the advantage of hindsight, don't we? Listen to me. No human being could have ever anticipated so much accurate detail about the coming Messiah so many centuries in advance. It's impossible. This book is entirely inspired by God, and you can trust it. You can trust your God who inspired this book, and you can trust Jesus, the Christmas Messiah. You can trust him with your everything. You must trust him with your everything. Jesus Christ is none other than the great I am, God in the flesh. Let's pray. Father, thank you for additional mosaic pieces to this Messiah mystery. May we see your Son in the Old Testament scriptures and see how you were foreshadowing the coming Christmas that you were going to bring into the world. God, we love you for that. We adore you. We see your mind and your beautiful design behind all these pieces, behind all these mysteries. And we say together, hallelujah, praise to God for being so wise, so good, so loving, so willing to save fallen people. Lord, we love you today, and we ask that the true Christmas Messiah and the Messiah mystery would become ours, and we would own it and love it and appreciate it forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.